even Christians have a horrible view of heaven, quite honestly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, an endless, I've heard, we'll be worshiping the Lord forever, just like an endless church service. And I'm a pastor <laughs> and I'm thinking, I don't want to do that. Yeah, right. <laughs> we have a great worship team, but you know, forever. Yeah. You know, so, so uh, I think it gives people hope because it's exactly what the Bible has been telling us all along, but for some reason we don't really imagine it that way. Because if we did, uh, we would live for it. This is the Made to Advance podcast. I'm your host, Brian Olick. We're here to inspire and equip you for your best future. Well, welcome everybody. It is so good to be with you today, and I'm so glad you're on Made to Advance. Before we get started with our conversation, I wanna ask you a favor. If you have appreciated this podcast, please rate and review us. That helps us get the word out about Made to Advance, and it also helps us bring on incredible guests like the one we have today. John Burke is with us, and he is the former pastor, founding pastor, of an amazing, amazing church called Gateway Church in Austin, Texas. John has researched over a thousand cases of near-death experiences or NDEs, which led him to become the, best sell- the author of a best-selling book called Imagine Heaven. And then he followed that book up with a book called Imagine the God of Heaven. John has traveled to over 30 countries, training and equipping more than 100,000 people. And John, it is so good to have you on Made to Advance. Oh, thanks, Brian. Great to be here. You know, it's funny. I was excited and eager and looking forward to this conversation. And uh, I was at a funeral uh, that a friend of mine uh, that you also know, Scott Rubin, was doing. He was leading a funeral for his father. And, and he was doing such a great job. And then right in the midst of his comments, he starts talking about your book. And I thought, uh, I thought this is perfect timing. And he just had uh, so many great things. Uh, it was really fun to hear, hear him say so many great things about, about it at such an important, uh, important time. Do you get that a lot where people say it comes up at funerals and, and those kinds of occasions where people are trying to speak hope in life? Yeah, particularly imagine heaven. Um, you know, I think, I think because it, it, it changes the, the perspective, right? Like, I mean, even Christians, you know, when we think about death, we think of something looming and horrible. And, you know, we don't, even Christians have a horrible view of heaven, quite honestly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, an endless, I've heard, you know, we'll be worshiping the Lord forever, just like an endless church service. And I'm a pastor <laughs> and I'm thinking, I don't want to do that. Yeah, right. <laughs> we have a great worship team, but, you know, forever. Yeah. You know, so so uh, I think it gives people hope because it's exactly what the Bible has been telling us all along. But for some reason, we don't really imagine it that way, because if we did, uh, we would live for it. You know, we would totally. we would be like like the heroes of Hebrews chapter 11 who weren't looking for a country of their own here on Earth because they were looking for a heavenly country. Right on. I'm curious, and it's funny because I had thought about asking this question, but you're, and I, I, did, I thought, oh, no, I'm not going to write it down, but I, you're hitting right on a question I was thinking about, which is, why do you think there is such a uh, malformed, kind of anemic view of heaven in the church? Because I think you're right on. I've thought about that many times, but what it just seems so weird to me that we have this incredible perspective in the scripture, and then it doesn't seem like it's captivated the imagination of Christians. Well, I think that is a big part of it. I mean, I think our imagination, um, you know, when we imagine, it doesn't mean everything we imagine is imaginary, right? Imagination is a gift from God that I think is tied somewhat to faith. I mean, if you think about it, like, um, you know, why would you live for something that's less than this. You won't. Right. And many don't, by the way. <laughs> and that's and that's a problem. It's all in the scriptures. Um, and my book, Imagine Heaven, it's filled with scripture. Imagine the God of heaven as well. But it's filled with scripture showing how what, what these, you know, well over a thousand people that I've interviewed are commonly experiencing, saying they're seeing and hearing and experiencing um, is all right there in the scriptures. But when you hear it through their eyes, suddenly it's like putting color on 
a black and white painting, mm -hmm. right? It brings it to life. It makes it more vivid. And I think in the scriptures, you know, unless you, I mean, I, I studied systematic theology, unless you do a systematic study of the afterlife, the life to come in scripture, you wouldn't necessarily see that. And, and then you have to use your imagination even beyond that. So, you know, Randy Alcorn did, he wrote, he wrote an excellent book um, on heaven. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's, it's, you know, it's more of a theological treatise on it, but, but he did do a, you know, full systematic study and used imagination to go, okay, if it's like this, then what might it be like? So what I was trying to do is, is a similar thing, but help people see through the eyes of these people having near death experiences, which I have come to believe I didn't admit initially, but I've come to believe our God's testimonies to our globally connected world, showing that heaven is real, mm -hmm. hell is real, and, and he is the God of all nations. And he always has been. And, he, and he's calling all his children home. That's what he did to provide a way for him through Jesus. Well, I can't wait to unpack a little bit more about just when we talk about near-death experiences, what do those usually involve? What do they look like? But there was one question I just felt like I had to ask before we even got into the, the kind of the meat of the subject. You started out professionally as an engineer. You end up as a pastor. <laughs> Not many people uh, think of that as a natural career trajectory. I'm going to get my engineering training and then end up as a pastor and pastor of a great, vibrant church. How in the world does that happen? Well, it, ironically, it passes right through the whole topic of near-death experiences, which is, I know, it sounds bizarre, but I was, I was an agnostic. I thought Jesus was a, a good teacher you know, made legend, not the son of God. I thought, God, who knows? I mean, there's no evidence, so probably not. Um, and, and that was because I had a lot of questions and I had very few, really no people take the time to be able to answer any of them or even direct me. Hmm. And so I came to that conclusion, was going along my partying merry way when my dad's dying of cancer and someone gave him the very first research that coined the term near-death experience. And I see it on his bedside table. And, um, and I started reading it. Uh, and I think they gave it to him because he was dying. And this is, this is hope that there's life beyond. Right. And, and so I'm like, whoa, what is this? And I, and I didn't put it down. I read the whole thing in one night. And here I'm reading about people, if you don't know what a, a near-death experience is, and, and I don't even like the term near-death experience because the ones I study are not nearly dead. They're dead dead. Uh -huh. They are clinically dead. Um, their heart stops beating, brain waves cease, and yet they are resuscitated, sometimes after minutes, but sometimes after hours. Um, Sometimes I think it's modern medicine bringing them back, but sometimes, quite honestly, it's just a miracle. Mm -hmm. But they come back talking, and this is what I'm reading, about this, that they were more alive than they've ever felt in a place more real than this has ever felt. And then many of them talking about in the presence of this God of light and love, who is personal, who, whose presence they never wanted to leave. And, and many of them also talked about seeing Jesus. Hmm. And because of that, I was like, wow, okay, maybe this is the evidence I've been looking for. Maybe this God, Jesus, afterlife stuff could be real after all. That's what actually opened me up to start studying the Bible. No kidding. And so then I start studying the Bible and, and it wasn't near-death experiences that led me to faith in Christ. It was actually the historical verification of the things God said in the Old Testament, I'm the only one who knows the future. Here's what's going to happen. He foretold, you know, what would happen in 1948 with the reformation of Israel after 1900 years scattered. Mm -hmm. And it happened that that for a skeptical engineering mind, I was like, I can't explain that. Like he said, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. That's how you'll know I'm really God. Yeah. Here's what's going to happen. And then the same thing uh, for, for all the prophecies of, the coming Messiah yeah. fulfilled in Jesus. So that's actually what led me to faith. It okay. took me 35 years and, and researching over a thousand near death experiences before I wrote about it um, in 2015. And I wrote imagine heaven back then. And then I wrote imagine God this year. 
um, and, and actually uh, passed the leadership of our church to speak on this. And, and the reason is, is because I really do believe that this is, this is God's new global apologetic. I think he's raising up these testimonies. In this new book, Imagine the God of Heaven, I have interviewed people, uh, 70 people having near-death experiences after being clinically dead on every continent. Wow. And how, how do you meet all these people? That's what I'm, when I hear you talk and write about all these different people, you'll go country after country that you're talking with people. And I keep thinking, how are these connections happening? Well, I know. And I mean, you know, they happened over 35 years mm -hmm. <laughs> for the, for the first book. Interestingly, um, you know, when, when I felt like the Lord wanted me to write the second book, I said to him, cause I kind of quit. I, you know, you know how hard it is pastoring a church. Right. And, um, I'd written, I'd actually written four books and after I wrote imagine heaven and even though it became a New York times bestseller and was still selling, I just, I said to the Lord, I think I did what you wanted. Mm -hmm. You didn't call me to be an author. You called me to be a pastor. So I'm going to do that unless you tell me otherwise. Um, because it was, it was just a lot. And so then he did. And, uh, and, and it was, it, you know, it was past the leadership. I want you to focus on this. And it, it is because I, I do think he's doing something. I think he's showing the nations. He is the God of all nations. Um, and, and when else could it happen? So after when he, when he asked me to write again, I said to him, I said, well, I had 35 years to research. Yeah. <laughs> you got to help me. And I'm not kidding you, Brian. People started reaching out to me with people from all over the world. Cause, they, cause wow. you know, imagine heaven had been out like six years, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, had, had was, was pretty well known. So, so yeah, I mean, a lot of them wow. came to me. I was, I was kind of blown away. When we think of near death experiences, uh, for lack of better terms, since yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. That's this is not near death. They're dead, and and yet there are, but there are some common. It seems like themes or ideas you've heard from what people experienced. You already mentioned some of them. Do you want to expand on that at all, as far as what yeah. people typically experience in as as you've had these conversations and done the research? Yeah, absolutely. And let me let me say first for the you know the person listening. Christian or not, that may be skeptical of near-death experiences. I get it. And it did take me 35 years to write because, you know, there's there's some things that people say that can be confusing. And I had to realize that what is what I'm looking at is what is reported again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily how they interpret what they're reporting, what any one person interprets. Right. And, and that's an important differentiation um, because... Well, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and I, I appreciate also when you talk about near-death experiences, you acknowledge uh, ultimately their testimony, their someone's interpretation of their experience, but it's you do such a great job, I think, of saying, hey, we're always going to hold the Bible's authority over the, the any, any stories of NDEs that we might evaluate and recognize that just because a person had a certain experience uh, doesn't mean we're going to hold it at the level of, okay, this is perfect truth because that was their experience. We're going to hold the, the scripture over it and, and maybe even interpret their experience in light of scripture versus yeah. going the other way around more so. so uh, but no, what, and, were you, what were you going to say? Well, and that is why in Imagine the God of Heaven, I, I bring together the case for the God of history the, all the prophetic fulfillment in actual history that convinced me as a skeptical engineer of the, of the, the Bible's validity mm -hmm. and inspiration, as well as how all these people from every religious background, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't matter their religious background or expectation. Mm -hmm. They're describing the God of scripture. And that's what I'm trying to bring together yeah. and show so that for that very reason that, um, Near-death experiencers come back and they're still people. They're sinful people. They struggle. They can they can either seek this God they experience or they can go away from them. You know, I, I like to say it's a testimony like any testimony. Um, it's another worldly testimony, but it's still a testimony. So if you interviewed 100 people on the streets of Jerusalem after Jesus' resurrection, 
50 of them would say, oh, yeah, I, I saw him raise the dead. How can you not believe he was raised from the dead and, and the Messiah? Of course, mm -hmm. he's the Messiah. And 50 more would say, I saw him. I saw Lazarus. I saw Lazarus raised from the dead. But he's doing it by the power of the demonic. He's a sorcerer. That's what our religious teachers say. So they both report the same thing. Jesus right. raised him from the dead. But their interpretation is vastly different. Right. So the same can happen with near-death experiences. But what they're commonly reporting aligns with Scripture. So I'll, I'll go through. Um, I'll do it this way. I, because uh, two things that have that really started to convince me with a near-death experience is first that they can actually observe things while out of their body they should not have been able to see. Hmm. And those have been verified. Um, so when a person first says they die, they leave their body, they talk about how they have a spiritual body. They're still themselves, in fact, more themselves than they've ever felt. In fact, I'm amazed at how many of them, I'll, I'll ask them, do you know you're dead? And they'll say, well, at this point, I, I, I guess not. Because I was one moment alive, and then I was more alive. Mm. And they talk about how alive, not just with five senses, but it seems like sometimes 50 senses, blended to other, other senses. Wow. Um, now, interestingly, when they're in the spiritual body, many times they're still in the room of their resuscitation. And as a result, when they come back, even though they had maybe no heartbeat, no brain waves, they're able to describe what, what was happening in the room, who, who said what, things that can be checked out and verified. Um, so, for instance, this uh, one cardiologist I interviewed in, in uh, uh, the Netherlands, Dr. Pim van Lommel, um, he, a guy comes into the ER. He had been found dead in a park 30 minutes earlier, brings him into the ER. They go to shock his heart. Um, tried to uh, intubate him, but there were dentures in his mouth. The nurse takes the dentures, puts them in the lower drawer of the crash cart. They intubate him. They shock him. They get his heart going again. And then, but he is still unconscious in the ER. So he came in unconscious, left unconscious. A week later in another room, he comes to, and he's complaining that you lost my dentures. And then he sees the nurse and he says, that nurse, that nurse knows where my dentures are. Huh. And then he explained that I was up above trying to get your attention and no one would listen to me and described who was in the room and that that nurse had taken his dentures and put them in the lower drawer of that cart with all the bottles on it. And that's where they found it. And that Dr. Pim Van Lommel, who studied these, actually wrote that up in The Lancet, Europe's most prestigious medical journal. Mm. So there have been actual studies done showing that these observations uh, are 92% completely accurate, another 6% mostly accurate. Each may make five or six observations. Only 2% in the study were inaccurate. Wow. So this grounds these experiences in our reality. The second thing, though, that really convinced me is that when people blind from birth have a near-death experience, they can see. And they report the same things as sighted people. And they report things about heaven they would not have ever heard on earth. Hmm. So I'll tell you about some of the commonalities. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about some of the scripture connections through uh, Vicky, who is a blind uh, person that, that I write about. She dies in a car accident. She's, again, she's up above her body. As they commonly say, it's like, I was trying to adjust to this new perception I was having that's sight. Mm -hmm. And she said, she said, I knew Jesus and I knew where I was going. It was a chaos in the, in the emergency room. And she takes off. She shoots up through the hospital and out and into this tunnel that takes her to this place of incredible light at the end. And, and she comes out into this beautiful garden-like setting. Okay, so those are all commonalities. Mm -hmm. um, leaving your body, a new spiritual body, um, which, by the way, Paul talks about all this. Right. Right? And Paul may have had a near-death experience. In, in Acts chapter 14, it says he was stoned to death in Lystra, drug out of the city, and left for dead. 
and the believers rallied around him. He gets up, right? He 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 comes to and he goes back into the city, mm-hmm. which, you know, why would you do that after you'd been stoned to death? Right. <laughs> and and something miraculous obviously happened. Yeah. Right. But in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, 14 years ago, whether in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. All right. Why? Well, because we still have a spiritual body. He said, I was taken up to the third heaven and saw and heard things inexpressible. So maybe that 14 years earlier was that time in Lystra. Mm-hmm. I don't know for sure. But, but he writes about in 1 Corinthians 15, our bodies are buried a natural body. They're raised a spiritual body. They're buried in weakness. They're raised in duname, power. Mm-hmm. The same word we use to, for dynamite, right? And these near-death experiencers talk about these new powers of this spiritual body. Like eyesight that is telescopic, can see for thousands of miles, um, as if you're right up close. Wow. Communication that's pure, that's thought to thought, heart to heart. Um, now these things initially, I thought, well, that's kind of new age weirdy, you know, and that's not in the Bible. And then the Lord showed me, well, actually, you know, in revelation chapter 21, John, Jesus disciple is taken up into heaven and brought onto a very high mountain. He says, looking over the holy city of God. And he reads the names on the foundation stones. How? Unless he had like telescopic eyes. Yeah, right. Right. Um, we have the mind of Christ. I think the way the Holy Spirit speaks to us today is heart to heart, thought to thought, complete communication. But as Jesus many times said, you have to have ears to hear. Mm-hmm. So we have to learn to have spiritual ears to hear. Um, and I think that's the communication you get on the other side. So these are all commonalities. Traveling is a commonality. And it, sometimes it's through a tunnel, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's with angels um, and and they're just going. It's like out through our atmosphere and out into the solar system and the universe. Mm-hmm. And they come, which, which sounds weird and bizarro until you realize this. I think what's going on here is imagine if we're living this three-dimensional spirit experience on a flat black and white painting in the wall of your house. Okay, so we only have up and down and side to side. We don't even have the dimension in or out. Mm-hmm. So death means separation. It's when our soul separates from our body. So imagine your two-dimensional soul separating from that two-dimensional plane and suddenly coming out into a three-dimensional world all around you, a world of color and, and new dimensions. You could see what's going on in your flat two-dimensional world because it's contained within. So that describes how they can see what's going on. Right. Then you're pressed back into it and you have to describe, you know, three dimensions of color in flat black and white two-dimensional terms. Yeah. And that's what I think near-death experiencers are, are doing. So when they when they take off through our atmosphere and out through, you know, the universe, well, it's all contained within a greater reality that is both the in the Hebrew mind, the first heaven was what we can see of the heavens, right? The second heaven is the spiritual realm all around us. The third heaven was the kingdom of God, where the holy city, the new Jerusalem is. And I think near-death experiencers are experiencing that exactly. I wonder, you know, as you're talking, John, Back to even the question of why the why we maybe don't talk about this as much at the church level or people don't have kind of an imagination for it. I wonder if we many times as pastors are trying to put things in such practical terms, we're trying to make it seem, you know, on the one hand, you're trying to help make a, a relationship with God accessible, normal sounding, et cetera. And when we talk about eternal realities, they're so utterly fantastic. I mean, we just, there's no, we can't even begin to get our arms around them. So then even when we look at the passages, you know, you see Paul talking about, I'm caught up in the third heaven. You're like, you know what? That sounds weird. I'm not going to preach on that because people are just going to be, what are we going? Star Trek here? What are we doing? You know, this is just, it just sounds kind of weird. And And, I'll tell you, Brian, I didn't preach on it that much. Yeah. (laughs) And when I did, 
I took a whole series to do it mm -hmm. or, you know, I would really, because you do have to build a case mm -hmm. um, because most people don't, they don't live there. They don't travel there. And I try to, you know, I try to remind myself of that often. Cause I'm like, man, I just, this is weird. It is weird, <laughs> and, but it's so compelling Yeah, when you see, and that's why, you know, I, I, I didn't speak on it that much until I put it down in a book. Mm -hmm. Um, I would occasionally, I mean, I, I actually gave my first, um, talk on this in 1989 at the university of California, Santa Barbara. Ah. And I did it. I did an outreach talk just to, to students showing that these things that are starting to be discovered align with what the Bible has been saying. And that's when I first started, you know, seeing all this. Why do you think that, uh, well, I'm guessing that you've found that both folks who are people of faith and Christians, and also probably folks I'm guessing that are not particularly people of faith, um, have found your book interesting reading. I, I, I'd be curious to hear the reactions uh, for from both sides, how do people uh, how do people hear hear and respond to uh, what they read? Um, I mean, what's been so encouraging is how many people have told me they've come to faith mm. as a result, or or believers sending it to non believing family or friends, and they're like, "This is the first thing that's opened them up." And I think it's because it. It reads kind of like science fiction. A little bit. <laughs> I mean, it does. It yeah. takes your imagination and you just get kind of like, oh my gosh, like even if you don't believe it, you know, I don't believe this, but this is, this is wild, mm -hmm. you know, and like all the data and then hearing it through their, through their eyes, you know, of, of what they're describing. And then I think for Christians, it's helped a lot of Christians see oh my gosh, this does align mm -hmm. and it's going to be way better than I ever imagined, you know, or God is way better than, you know, why don't I trust him more? Um, that's been, that's been the majority of reactions. That's really cool. And the negative ones, you know, I, I, I have had friends and even pastor friends who have said, I got to be honest with you, man. When I first heard you wrote that book, I was like, Okay, if I didn't know him, I would think he'd totally flipped. What <laughs> in the world? Because it's so different than what I had written on before. Um, and he said, and then I read it, and I was like, oh my gosh. Because you see, I mean, you know, and mm -hmm. and and so it does take a while to to see the whole case. You've you've talked a little bit about uh in other places I've heard you, you share th that people have visions of heaven, but also sometimes have visions or glimpses of hell. And I would just be curious, and sometimes both in the same near-death experience. Tell me yeah. about, uh, tell me about that. Expand on that if you would. Yeah. I mean, in the new book in Imagine the God of Heaven, I was kind of shocked at how many that the Lord brought me from all over the world had visions of both. And I was kind of asking them like, what's that about? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I'll tell you, um, one of the ones I love the most, and he's such a dear man, uh, Santosh Akarji, who grew up in India. Uh, his father was a Sanskrit scholar. The Hindu scriptures were all he knew. Um, he was a manufacturing engineer. Uh, his heart coded when his, when his um, gallbladder uh, erupted into his pancreas. He thought, he told me, I thought when you die, there's just nothing, or maybe I'd come back as another life form, but that's not what happened. This brilliant light brighter than the sun. And they say brighter than the sun, like a thousand times brighter, but not hard to look at mesmerizing. He said, comes to me. And then I could see my body down on the, on the table. Um, and he said, I knew that this was the ultimate authority. I knew this was a divine light, that, that this was God. There was no doubt. And I fell in love with this light because I knew he was there to protect me and take me someplace safe. Mm -hmm. And so they travel and they go through a tunnel as well. Um, I have a whole theory on what the tunnel is now. I've changed my mind, but it's another thing. <laughs> but they come to a place where he he says the light stops 
over this giant compound. Now, if you've ever, we, we built a hospital in India. Um, so I've been to India many times. They're compounds, these big walled gated communities everywhere. So he, he called it a giant, enormous compound with these very high, very beautiful walls in the shape of a square. This is exactly what he said. Hmm. In the shape of a square and inside. Uh, and, and he told me, he said, you know, there your eyesight is like you can see for miles and miles. And he said it was it was thousands of miles long. And he said inside these gorgeous grounds, just beautiful and um, mansions, big buildings of otherworldly building material. That's what he said. And he was a manufacturing engineer. So that's how he's describing it. Yeah. And he said, and I, I long to go into this place. I knew this is, this is the place every human wants to be. And he looked for a way in and he said, I, I counted there were 12 gates, 12 entrances in, but they were all closed to me. And I looked at the one closest to try to find a way in. And I saw angels guarding the gate. And then I knew I'm looking at the kingdom of heaven. Hmm. Okay, now, now think about this. He's never read the Bible. He's only read the Hebrew scriptures. And he perfectly described what John describes in Revelation 21 of the holy city of God. You said Hebrew scriptures. I think you meant uh, the religion. Uh, the re religion. Was he raised as a Christian or you, you said Hebrew scripture? Oh, no, He's no, read no, the Hebrew, Sanskrit, I think. Or uh, what, what? He only knew the he, uh, the he only knew the Hindu scriptures. Hindu scriptures. There we go. Important, not the, not important Hebrew, differentiation. Hindu. Yeah. Yes. Very important. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he only knew the Hindu scriptures. Yeah, um, and and so so he has this vision mm -hmm. of heaven, the holy city, right? And and he's looking for a way, and he looks, and he's like, "Where am I?" And he's up on this very high platform, and he looks to his left, and he looks down, and he described a, a, an abyss of darkness that dropped forever. It looked like into a pit of fire. That's how he described it. That is amazing. And he said, I knew if I fell in there, I could never get out. It was hopeless. And so he, so he describes a vision of hell and he doesn't want to go there. He wants to go in the city, but he, he doesn't know another way. And he turns and anyway, he has this vision or he sees who he now thinks was Jesus on a throne. Hmm. But all he saw was this man who was giant in a robe, and he looks up into his eyes, and he said he had eyes of lightning. Wow. So he's describing the risen Jesus, right? right? Not, not the, the human Jesus, the risen Jesus. And as soon as he saw, looked into his eyes, he said, my whole life was flashed before me. I saw all my sins, even the ones I had forgotten. He hadn't forgotten. And he falls to his knees and says, Lord, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. And he thought the Lord was going to throw him into the pit because that's what he, he knew he deserved. And when the Lord speaks to him, Santosh said, well, he says to him, Santosh, I'm sending you back to the earth. And when you go back, you must love, love your family and especially your daughter. She needs your help right now. And he said there was such compassion and mercy and love and tenderness in the Lord's voice that he, he started to like warm up a little bit and he sees, he said to the right side of, of, of this platform and this throne, uh, what he called a very narrow gate. It was so narrow. It, 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 it was strange to him how narrow it was, but it was open into the kingdom of heaven. It was open to him. The only, only gate open. And anyway, long story short, he comes back and he is seeking with all his heart. Mm-hmm. So he's every day praying. He, he, he said, you know, the, who was this God of mercy and, and compassion and love? He was not like the Hindu gods I knew. And he was praying to know him. And, you know, the Lord says in Jeremiah, if you seek me with all your heart, you'll find me. Right. And two years later, his daughter is invited to sing in a church choir. She was a choral major in college. Santosh goes to hear her. He feels the loving presence of that same God as he walks into the church. And the message was on Matthew 7 um, about, about uh, 
the the narrow the narrow gate. Mm-hmm. You must you must take the narrow gate, and then Matthew uh, John chapter ten, where Jesus says, "Truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come in through me will be sh- will be saved." Wow. And he went home, read the Bible, and said everything I experienced was in this book, and became a follower of Jesus. Wow. So I have seventy interviews I did personally with people all over the globe like that Mm. where God, and here's what's fascinating, Brian, God gives them, it's, it's kind of like parables. So he doesn't tell them. And this, this tripped me up for a while. He's like, okay, well, if this God of light and love is really the God of the Bible, why didn't he tell them I'm Jesus, you know, I'm the way, the truth and life, go follow me. Here's the gospel. I died for your sins. Pray this prayer, you know, right. He doesn't do that. Yeah. And that was very confusing to me for many years until I realized, wait a second, Paul was not a believer in Jesus, went on the Damascus. He was going to arrest and persecute and even kill Christians when the same God of light appears to him on the Damascus road, Acts chapter Mm nine, right? And he says, who are you, Lord? And when he asks, he says, I'm Jesus, who you're persecuting. But he doesn't tell him the gospel. He doesn't tell him what to do. He later sends Ananias, a person, a man, because that's his method. And Ananias explains it to Paul. And then Paul still had a decision to make. He had a lot to lose turning from Phariseeism. Will I be baptized for the remission of my sin and follow Jesus? So these near-death experiences are like that. They can see this God of light and love. They can see the reality of heaven and hell. But when they come back, they still have to decide, will I seek? And when they seek, they do fine. Yeah. I mean, almost all of them do. So it's almost like, a, and I know you used the word apologetic earlier. It's like a pre-evangelism, God reaching out to people and helping prepare their hearts and minds for something more, but also they, they have to take, like, as you're saying, they have to seek, they have to take a step. And ultimately, it's, it's even good what you're saying as far as reaffirming what we see throughout scripture, which is the primary way, way people step into a relationship with God is through hearing someone tell them about Jesus explicitly. I think sometimes people think, well, if God's going to get to them anyway in a country that's hard to reach through dreams and visions, wh- why do we need to go? Why, don't we, why do we need to talk about Jesus? And what I hear you saying is God is indeed generously giving experiences out to help people uh, examine their own hearts and their own spiritual journeys, but still so important that they end up encountering someone who can share Jesus with them. He wants everyone to know, you know, uh, like, I, like I like to say, um, nobody has perfectly kept, uh, um, you know, the, the, the five pillars of Islam, the eightfold path of Buddhism. Uh, they haven't, they don't have perfect karma. Um, you know, we haven't kept the Ten Commandments. You haven't even kept your own moral law. Right. You ever said, I'll never, and you did? (laughs) So it's like God wants everyone to know that though we have all sinned and fallen short of his standard, of his glory, he has made a way that every human heart that wants him can have him and can not walk in condemnation, which is what most walk in. Right. If they don't know what God's done through Jesus, they walk in condemnation and guilt. But to know that there is forgiveness and and relationship with God available. So, yeah. And he's doing this all. I I think, though, these near-death experiences are not even so much for that person. Because the interesting thing is how many of them argue with God. Mm. Um, Like even Santosh, uh, others, they argue with God. I don't want to go back. Let me stay. Huh. And he says, no, I'm sending you back for a purpose. So I think these are testimonies for us and wow. for the nations. You know, like a, a couple other fascinating ones, um, BB in um, Tehran. So in the news right now, right? <laughs> so she gave me this testimony in Farsi, in, in the Persian language, and it was translated. Um, she codes... She's she's thinking the prophet Ali is going to come and, and, and judge her because her son, who was Hezbollah, 
actually became a Christian through mm. a vision of Jesus. Huh. And he led his sister to, to faith in Jesus. Um, and so she felt like a total failure to Allah and to Islam. And she, she has this vision like that she's going to have a horrible judgment, but, but the prophet Ali did not come this giant man, like, just like Santosh described in a, in a, in a glorious robe and light emitting from him comes and she knows this is a divine presence. And he says, I am he who is. That's how it was translated to me in English from her Farsi. Hmm. I am he who is. Wow. And boom, she's in her body again. But she said with a joy and a peace she had never felt. It starts her on a journey. She didn't know who, who this was, but discovered, well, this is the same God of light that appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai in the burning bush that didn't burn, right? And says, I am he who is. I am who I am. Right. I'm the eternal one. And so I, I, I see the same thing happening where it's like God gives them, it's all, like I said, Jesus was a parable loving God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he still is. Yeah. He wants to know, will we seek him? And when we seek him with all our heart, we do find him. And, and these people do. BB did. Um, some now, interestingly, some just know. I mean, Heidi was a 16 year old Jewish girl who grew up with an atheist abusive father um, who told her every night, told his three daughters every night, there is no God. Your life is worthless. Jesus Christ is the biggest hoax ever perpetrated on mankind. Wow. And yet at eight, and yet she believed in God. He was very abusive. She grew up in a very abusive home. And, and, and so she always believed in God and prayed to God every night and felt his comfort. Like he was there by her bedside, comforting her, giving her peace, helping her go to sleep. So at 16, her horse, she's in a horseback accident on the side of a mountain. Her horse lands on her and crushes her. She's up 30 feet above her body. She knows she's dead. She sees a light over her shoulder to her right turns. And she said, there was Jesus. But he was shining brighter than the sun. But I knew he was Jesus. And she said, I, I wasn't thinking, what's a good Jewish girl like me doing with Jesus? I'm not supposed to be with Jesus. <laughs> He said, no, I knew him. Wow. I knew this was the God I had always prayed to. And she just intuitively knew. And then in her life review, she sees that he was the one sitting by her bed when she was a little girl at night, wow. comforting her, putting her to sleep. She saw Jesus. And then ironically, Jesus, not ironically, but Jesus takes her to God the Father, and she has a, an experience of God, this infinite light that she goes into, and then she's sitting and being held, she said, by God the Father, but also Jesus, but they were separate, but they were one, and she can't explain <laughs> how God can be a man, and God can be light, and God can be love. She said, I can't explain it, but that's what I experienced. That's amazing. You know, what strikes me as you're re reflecting on some of these different stories is for the person who is skeptical or thought, well, says, well, I, I don't know about all that. You know, you hear one or two, sure. But then when you hear similar themes repeatedly and, and, and such remarkable reflections, it really, after a time, you have to say, I mean, if you're going to be honestly a fair-minded person, you have to say, maybe there's something here. Maybe this isn't just a random one-off weird experience. I'm curious when it comes to Christians having these kinds of experiences, it would seem to me that the more your view of, of heaven, the, the more your understanding of heaven is compelling. And, and so you've had, let's say, a near-death experience, and all of a sudden you've seen things in a way that you've never seen before. How does that, or, and, and, or how should that affect then how we live today? I think that obviously eternity should be a big motivator for Christians, but as we said earlier, maybe not as much as it it ought to be these days. But when you when somebody gets that clear picture, how do you see them live differently because of it? Oh man, I mean, I think so many ways. You know, like, um, you know, one when you realize 
when you realize that when we get to the other side, we will be in the presence of God. We will know even as we are known, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13. And people know, people say that. And I've interviewed people who have suffered tremendously. And they've said, you know, how could a good God let this happen to me as a child? You know, like there can't be a God who loves me. But they did believe, but they didn't, but uh -huh. they did, but they, you know. And then they get into his presence and they said, just like Job, I, I didn't even ask my question. <laughs> I knew. I knew. Oh, like it makes so much sense. But and, and, and so I would say, so does it make sense now? He said, no, that actually is knowledge that was veiled when I came back, hmm. which interestingly, Paul said as well. In, in, in 2 Corinthians 12, when he said, you know, he's taken up to the third heaven, saw and heard things inexpressible and things no man is allowed to tell. Mm -hmm. So there's some things that near-death experiencers experience there. And when they come back, they, they knew they understood it there and it all made sense. But here it still doesn't. Yeah. But that alone can help us realize. And then, and then realizing what life in the in the city of god what life in paradise is going to be like like the beauty of mountains and trees and forests and valleys all of creation but but more mm. because this creation is deteriorating that creation's getting better it's the love and the life and the light of god that is filling everything so it's literally this life the best way to think about it is when you step from this life into the next life, it's not this drastic change. It's it's like life to, as, as one spine surgeon I interviewed said, it was like going from life into more life. Hmm. Reality into more reality. So we're going to live this life even more. That's the best way to think about it. And Jesus said all these things, but... There's going to be work to do. There are going to be responsibilities. There, there are there are houses. There are families. There are um, there are parties. There are you know wonderful adventures and experiences and 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 incredible things to do and see. Um, he said all this. Many people don't realize it because, like I said, they haven't put it all together in a systematic theology of heaven. But right. it's all there. Right. And when you start to see that. The, way, the best example I can have is that we, we save for retirement because we imagine playing golf and doing my favorite hobby or traveling the world or, you know, having these things and these great experiences and not the burden of work and all that. Well, we, we imagine retirement well, so we sacrifice for it. Mm -hmm. We labor for it. But it's not the thing to sacrifice and labor for because it's going to end. But what is coming is worth sacrificing for, is worth laboring for. And I do believe that um, the way we live our lives now, though heaven is a free gift, relationship with God is a free gift. That's what Jesus did on the cross. It's a heart turning to him for forgiveness and leadership. Jesus made that clear. But the way we live our lives does affect how we enter into the experience of eternity. Mm -hmm. And Jesus also talked about this a lot. He talked about rewards in heaven. He talked about whoever can be faithful with things that don't last will be trusted with things that do last. You know, don't just save up treasures here on earth. Save up treasures in heaven. Well, you think he was lying? Was it just a, a metaphor or is it actually We'll really experience that, right? right? I, I, and I feel and we like dumb it we're down. Going. We dumb it down too much. I you feel know? like all we treasures. You know. I feel like the more your picture of heaven is robust and filled out and filled with joy, it lets you do two things at the same time that are very difficult to do at the same time. On the one hand, when I see and have a view of a more 
physical Revelation 21, 22, new heavens, new earth kind of heaven, I can appreciate the joys that this life has to offer. I can say this is a foretaste of the good things that are to come. Uh, They won't even compare to how great things are that will be to come, but I can enjoy things. That being said, I can also not be addicted to things. And when Jesus talks about sacrificing for the kingdom of God, I can realize what is what is in eternity is going to be so much better. So it's worth the costs that I'm paying now. And I, I just think it's it's tough because sometimes I think that when people think of heaven, they get into this nothing in this world matters kind of a mode. And um, and then, you know, there are others who are everything in this world is, matters. And really, I don't think about heaven. And I think when you really got a good balanced picture of heaven, maybe you can do both. You, th- you think that's true? Enjoy yeah. things of this world and at the same time have a, dis- a-, a detachment from this world that lets you to pursue the kingdom of God with a newfound freedom and passion? Yeah, it's not, a, it's not an either or. It is a perspective. And, and, and that's what I think a, the, the right view of heaven and the right view of God, by the way, um, is that all of life is a gift from God. Every, you know, I, my, my favorite chapter in the new book, Imagine the God of Heaven, is, the, is doing life with the God of all joy. And what I'm showing is that we, we, have, we don't really believe that God could laugh, <laughs> that God could have a sense yeah, of humor, that totally. God could understand us, that God could be relatable like a best friend. And, and by the way, if you don't believe this, he is your best friend because no one else has been through every high and every low with you and is still crazy enamored with you. That's so good. And gets you better than you get yourself um, and even laughs at your bad jokes. You know, and 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 I think I think for a lot of Christians, you know, we put God in a box and we think, well, no, that's, you know, that I don't see anything in scripture where it says Jesus laughed. Well, Okay. Who do you think gave you laughter? Right. The devil? I mean, it's your creator. Right. Laughter, psychologists tell us laughter is a higher form of communication. It's a very higher type of communication. And But near-death experiencers talk about experiencing the joy of God, experiencing this the, the delights of heaven, that God actually delights to delight us. That he gives, I, I interviewed two commercial airline pilots who had near death experiences. Okay. Two different ones, didn't even know each other. Both of them describe God giving them a flyover of the holy city. Hmm. And both of them said, I guess because I was a pilot and he knew I would enjoy like a, like I'd flown into, you know, hundreds of cities all over the world. And, you know, God delights to give us joy. He is the God of all joy. And as C.S. Lewis says, joy is the serious business of heaven. Mm -hmm. But I think Christians don't have that view. And as a result, back to earth, we don't believe that God is the one who gives us pleasures. And so we don't thank him for it. Mm -hmm. We don't let him into it. You know, I have little granddaughters now. And, you know, when I had little kids, it was the same same thing. I love to give them good gifts and then watch them enjoy it and enjoy it with them. And you think I'm better than God? <laughs> no, right. I was created in his image in right. World too. So I, I, you know, just realizing that God is so much better than we've ever imagined. And what it does is it helps you realize that I can thank him and enjoy the things he's given me here more by seeking him than by turning away from him. Mm -hmm. And as I pay attention in the little moments and I thank him and I respond to his spirit and I think about others, you know what the life review shows us is that Matthew 25 is absolutely true. The, The life review is Matthew 25 where they experience watching how every little act of kindness, the ripple effect it had through humanity, you know, mm-hmm. and, or, or every little act of meanness, you know, or right. blow up. It, ha- it has an effect. And they come back saying God is love and how we love or treat one another is what God, what matters most to God. 
So I think what these do is it just takes the scriptures and it like lights them up with a neon light. Like, no, I meant it. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, that's what I, when I think of the purpose of our podcast, Made to Advance, we really want to equip and inspire people to live into their best futures. And uh, of course, you don't get much of a, a better future than, than heaven. And, uh, and, I, and I, I hope that as people are listening today, that they're really able to use this vision of heaven and hopefully, you know, pick up your books and be compelled to take it further. Because the, the, the more our imagination is captivated by what is to come, I feel like the better prepared we are to live faithfully in the life we're given in the present. And, and all of a sudden now, investing in relationships looks different and more valuable. All of a sudden, the money that maybe I want to clutch and cling to, I'm a little bit more willing to just freely give and invest in the kingdom because I realize there's so much more and so much better on the other side. So that's what I, part of, part of for me, being able to have this conversation with you today is just to inspire people a little bit with the goodness of God and what he has in front of them. Now, uh, maybe it's the last question. Well, no, two questions. Uh, first, I was going to ask you, between the two books, Imagine Heaven, Imagine the God of Heaven, where do you advise a person uh, if they could pick one to read first? Which one would you say to read first? No. Well, uh, it's really hard. I mean, imagine heaven gives all the commonalities of the heavenly experience and a little about the 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 God of heaven. Okay. Um, whereas, imagine the God of heaven. It's going to help you just fall crazy in love with God if you're not already. But trust Him more. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you, you'll be blown away by that. And I would say. Um, if you you know if you're a believer and you haven't read either, probably start with Imagine Heaven. Okay, and if you're not a believer, start with the first. Well, or no, excuse me, Imagine you, Heaven is the first. So you're saying if Imagine you're, God? Yeah, uh, you're saying. Would you say uh, you're saying if you're a believer, start with Imagine Heaven? Yeah, and, I mean, if you want to, if yeah. you want to see the totality, you know, like I, I talk about things like rewards in heaven, uh -huh. and you know, what will we do forever, and you know, time and how it works on the other side, and um, uh, you know, what our bodies will be like, what relationship will be like, uh, you know. If somebody's not a believer yet, John, who, uh, which book would you say for them? If they're if they're just asking questions, they're not sure what they think about Jesus. Would you start with the same? Well, you could accept that I'm really making a case in the first six or seven chapters of Imagine the God of Heaven. I'm bringing together both near-death experience research. Um, in chapter two, I go through the 10 points of evidence that convince me that these near-death experiences are worth listening to. Mm -hmm. But then in chapter three and four, I go through some of the historical prophetic fulfillment that this God of history is the same as the God revealing himself to all the nations. And then you get to hear it from all the nations. So a lot of people who are, who are like, they're really, you know, put off by Christians, you know, you're, um, you know, Jesus can't be the only way and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Well, they'll, they'll hear, I think, I think a big part of that is they misunderstand Jesus being the only way makes the only way but it makes a way for everyone. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're 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 just left up to our you know try hard religions. Right, right. Yeah, it's funny so, yeah, how that's that. Well, that's that's helpful. And uh, yeah, it is it is a funny thing how on the one hand, Christianity is rightly viewed very exclusive insofar as Jesus claims to be the only way, but he also says if you're willing to trust me. Anyone of any background can uh, can step into my path. So, with without having to check off all kinds of boxes of religious works and good deeds. So, it's weird because uh, you know Christianity is on the one hand very exclusive and very welcoming to anybody who's just willing to give their hearts to Him. Now, I'm gonna I'm gonna end on after this significant, massive topic: the goodness of God, heaven, eternity, all of it. I'm going to end with what probably feels like a very small question, but it's the number one question I get from people, and I bet you do too, when it comes to uh, what is any kind of afterlife experience going to be like, and that is, are my pets going to be there? 
<laughs> yes. That's the number one question I get. <laughs> yeah. So for just for fun, it seems like a weird question to end on. But because I know it's the number one question, let's just tackle it. What do you think about pets? I know. I'm like, you guys need to learn to love people more. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it is harder. It is harder, but it's more important. No. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, I interviewed uh, Karina, uh, this woman from Colombia, and she first has a hellish experience and is praying the Lord's Prayer, but fervently. And he pulls her out and brings her up and she sees this blinding light. And she says, send me back to hell. I'm not worthy. Mm. I know I'm filthy. I'm not worthy. And he says, no, you are come. I love you. And she's still skeptical. And she said, then Lord, show me some of my, show me some of the people I love who, who have gone on before me. And he said, look to your right. And there is Max, her little dog who had died earlier that year. Mm. And then her other dog who had died years later. And and in she goes. Huh. Um, Randy Kay, who is a CEO, uh, he dies of a pulmonary embolism, 30 minutes dead. He's there with Jesus holding him, and then they're they're walking. And at one point, Jesus, um, Jesus said, look. And he looks across a field, and here comes who he didn't have many friends in when he was a kid, the child growing up because he was bullied, but he had this one little dog, Casey, who would jump up on him and just lick him like a lollipop every day when he came home from school. Cross this field comes Casey, the dog who had died, jumps up on him and licks him like a lollipop. And Jesus said to him, see, beloved, I give you the desires of your heart. Hmm. That's the, Psalm 37, 4. Delight yeah. yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Yeah. So, yes. And, you know, and some Christians, I, I don't understand why, but there's no animals don't have souls. They're not going to be there in heaven, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you didn't read the Bible. There yeah. are definitely going to be lions and lambs and eagles. And Jesus is going to be riding a horse, I guess, without a soul. But it's all there in the Bible. Yeah. Well, that is the funny thing. And it's back to your point. This is where I think spending some time in your books, and you mentioned Randy Alcorn does a great job t- talking, tackling some of these same subjects. We don't, we have these little isolated verses, and sometimes you don't realize how big of a theme animals are in the Bible when describing eternity. It really is. Well, I mean, some of those primary images, the lying, laying down with the lamb, this idea that animals that have historically been in conflict, uh, operating in peace, your option. Now, maybe some say, well, it's all figurative. Man, I, I mean, you really have to put a lot in the figurative category if you're going to do that, because, and it sure doesn't sound like it's all figurative when you read it in the text. So I think that we, we've just got to sit with some of these verses. And that's why I really want to encourage uh, anyone who's listening or watching, uh, to pick up your books and take a good read because the more we can soak our souls in in the scriptures and other people's experiences that speak to those or, or testify to those same scriptures, the more we can have this robust imagination when it comes to the goodness of God and the goodness of the plan He has for us. So I just thank you so much, John, for uh, your work in this area. And I know that uh, stepping away from the church that you founded and led for so many years. It's just really an incredible church, and I've respected uh, your work in Austin for so long. And I really appreciate, in some ways, your example of your hope in the God of heaven and being willing to step away from such a great ministry and a great leadership position to go full-time in this in this kind of ministry. What you're doing is really a great example of everything we just talked about. You've got a vision of the God of heaven, and you're going to pursue Him, even if uh, there could have been some rewards of different kinds from staying put. So thank you so much for your ministry. Oh, thank you, Brian. I appreciate it. Well, I hope we get a time to talk sometime in the future, but I know this is going to be an encouragement to, to many. Again, pick up John's books. You can find him online. He's on social, all those good things. John, anything you want to say about how people can look you up? Um, imagineheaven.net is uh, the website you can go to. Okay. Imagineheaven.net. All right. Great. Well, thanks so much for this conversation and uh, we'll cross paths soon. Wow, what a great conversation with John. Hey, if you heard that conversation, I want to encourage you on a couple next steps. Um, Number one, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, uh, check out one of John's books and begin that seeking process. Maybe you're even sensing through this conversation 
that God is drawing your heart to Christ. And if that's the case, I would just encourage you to pray a very simple prayer where you acknowledge that you have sin and brokenness in your life and that you need Jesus as your Savior to forgive you. You need Jesus as your leader to help you live the life he created you to live. And if you are a follower of Jesus, I want to encourage you to spend some time thinking, dreaming, praying into heaven. Maybe pick up a book like the kind we've talked about today and start to fill your heart and mind with God's vision for heaven. What I have hoped and prayed for would come out of this conversation is more Christians who are captivated by heaven and therefore would be even more passionate about living for the kingdom of God with the time God gives them on this earth. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the episode. Again, if you have, please rate and review us. That's a great help to the podcast. This has been a production of Engetti Church, and we have more incredible conversations coming your way. So just know until next time, you were made to advance.